future belongs to the curious. This is an act of discovery. Come and experience it with us in Arakat and discover your creative potential. This is your path. This is your journey. You decide how it's going to be. Time to free your curiosity that's always in you. Come and experience it with us in Arakad and discover your creative potential. Hi. Uh, oops, sorry. This is Jemi Ardımcı. Uh, you are welcome to Arukat University Faculty of Design Department of Architecture webinar with Professor Dr. Tevfik Balcıoğlu. Uh, today, his presentation will be on design key elements and principles, reflections on art, architecture, and interiors, which will focus on the mysterious question, how we design elements of design without which we cannot develop, express, present, and implement our design ideas and principles guiding us du during design processes, working with critical thinking methods which may well go beyond the borders of design principles. Following the presentation, we will have a question and answer session with our uh, Architecture Studio One students. Hope uh, we will have an inspiring and interactive uh, webinar. Uh, welcome, uh, Mr. Tefik Baljoğlu. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, it's a pleasure to talk hey, with you. Hey. Right. I'm going to share my screen now and then begin my uh, slideshow. Okay. Are you able to follow? Hello. We are able. Is it okay? Yeah. Yes, uh, we are. Able. You see the screen. Uh, you see the first light on the screen. Hello. Hello. Do you see? Can we, I begin? We do, we do hear you, and we we see the presentation. Okay. Right. So I sh I will begin, and if there is a problem, please let me know, because I'm only able to see my uh, slides, <laughs> uh, not you anymore. Right. Okay. Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome again. Uh, this is uh, my cover for this presentation, uh, and I will explain later why I have selected this image. Actually, this is a detail from an interior, uh, Kash, in southern part of Turkey. But I will come back to this at the end of my presentation. Well, let's start with the introduction. Why uh, do I give this lecture? So, first of all, I want you to look critically into the elements and principles of design. So the word critically is very important one, right? Uh, because I want you to expand uh, their territories when possible. Although this list of key elements are given to you, but it doesn't mean that it's the end of it. No, you may develop it anytime you want with good critical questions, of course. Now, uh, to show uh, uh, how, to, um, well, I would like also to show how these principles are used as tools for observation in personal art and design journeys. It means that when I'm talking about uh, some key elements, I will be showing you some slides and many of them actually my own uh, slides. In other words, I have been in that places 
uh, and took these uh, pictures, right? So I'm using mostly uh, my own uh, images. Well, uh, another reason uh, or another one of the aims of this presentation is to encourage uh, people or you students, actually, in this particular case, to develop your own design framework, approach and philosophy. This is this is this is very, very important. Whatever you do as a designer, at the end of the day, you may try to develop your own understanding of design your own understanding of design philosophy. This is very, very, uh, I think, essential in order to be a very uh, successful designer. Right, the key elements. The key, uh, what are these key elements? Let's give a definition first of all. Key elements of design are concrete entities with which we create, measure, define, describe, analyze, and understand design works. In other words, we design and express our ideas with key elements. These key elements are present in every design, regardless of kind, quality, skill, taste, or style. So if you want to, of course you do want to make a design, you need to use key elements of design in order to express your ideas. So what are these key elements like? Well, line, color, light, texture, shape and form, material and tacit knowledge, and, and space. So here, I would like to emphasize this, material and tacit knowledge, because if you look at this list in any uh, design book uh, or on a website, uh, when you are searching for key elements of design, you may not see this. So this is my edition. We can discuss it later, whether it's appropriate or not. But I personally uh, believe that this should be one of the key elements of uh, design. Okay, let's start with line. What is line? We all know what line is. The connection of two points in space, maybe straight, curved, vertical, horizontal, diagonal, scalloped, dotted, dashed, broken, zigzag lines and so on. It continues like that. So actually, I divided them into two. Uh, for me, there are two kinds of lines, regular geometric and irregular organic. As a general umbrella term, I'm using this. Okay. So these are the images uh, I get from the internet. Right? But when you look at them carefully, you see the differences in vocabulary. Uh, the first one says dashed and dotted. The other one says for the same thing, dashed uh, or, the, uh, or uh, dotted. And the other one says broken, right? You see the differences? Well, you will see more. For instance, the first one says, says zigzag and then jagged one. But when you look at the one in the middle, uh, you see that it's uh, very, very regular. But the first one was not. Or the third one. So you see the differences in interpretation and differences in vocabulary. But well, the same thing about this wavy lines. Well, the first one looks like a wave uh, on the sea, and the other one is, well, you cannot, I cannot personally um, resemble it, any of those things I know. Uh, and the third one is, yes, wavy, but, but not horizontal, vertical. We all know that waves are vertical, actually. Uh, so you see the differences in interpretation. So be careful when you are uh, making reference to that. But lines, lines have their own meanings. Uh, now, these are obviously interpretations. Uh, but but uh, as you see here, they are not independent of our feelings, our thoughts. So you use line to express uh, your ideas, but also your feelings. Uh, to which extent uh, these are uh, valuable, I'm not going to judge them. But what I notice here is that they are showing the waves and they call it unstable. Yes, a wave we see is probably unstable. Uh, right. So uh, this is another list of uh, mood lines that you can use and develop your visual language. I think it's very important that you develop your own visual language and, and attribute uh, certain meanings uh, to lines. For instance, 
this is a geometric regular lines as you see it immediately but when when i look at it i perceive it as a kind of uh, three dimensional uh, form like a tent structure but it's just composed of lines so you can see the power of lines how they can actually visualize uh, different things uh, in a very powerful way or or we can come across straight lines in life uh, like this cables everywhere it's part of uh, cityscape uh, whether it's good or not it's something else but it's important to be able to notice them and see uh, their power and i'm not talking about the electricity <laughs> but i'm talking about the power of lines what sort of impact they create on you i think it's very very important when you observe these things uh, when you're in a different environment now there are of course uh, geometric lines uh, very strong geometric lines and they create shapes and forms this is uh, of uh, one of them obviously a uh, kind of a tower but the most important one uh, is probably this tower now this is historically architecturally is a very important um, structure uh, designed by Vladimir Shukov uh, in 1920-22 and it was supposed to be higher than the Eiffel Tower but it didn't work because uh, <laughs> uh, there were scarcity at that time these are the war years after just first world war and there were a revolution uh, in in uh, Russia at that time uh, so because of uh, the limited uh, amount of material they were able to build only 160 meter but it's a very uh, interesting building because it's possible to uh, get uh, to top of it with a uh, small simple lift that you can see here so, but on the other hand you see again the power of lines circles uh, and straight lines uh, and the tension uh, amongst them the form that they created the beauty of it actually in one sense well yes there are some artworks uh, composed of uh, lines this is uh, an image from uh, Stuttgart or or again uh, this time well it's very confusing you don't know what it is when you look at like that it appears to be a kind of maybe a painting maybe a drawing uh, well uh, actually uh, it is uh, a excellent uh, sculpture by a famous sculptor Anthony Gormley from Royal Academy exhibition I visited in 2019 so you can see the power of lines in a different way this is a kind of a three-dimensional lines and they are forming uh, the huge uh, huge sculpture on top of you and and your feelings underneath are very 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 uh, mixed uh, it's not easy to uh, grasp the energy that it gives to you unless you go there and feel it and how difficult it is to establish the right i don't know how he made it actually but he also made other things uh now we'll come to that point uh, let's look at the other lines organic lines or free lines or irregular lines very kinds of lines that you cannot easily uh, imitate it's because they are not the geometric ones uh but yes uh, in these days thanks to technology uh, we can uh, copy and repeat them but you can see how freely organically flowing they are now with these organic lines you can make something else you can turn them into a, an expression of a three-dimensional object uh, or a part of a body then you see how lines how uh, are stronger how stronger they are or as you see in this one for instance right so don't underestimate the power of lines that's why i'm underlining uh, again and again now let's go back to uh, anthony gormley you can see again irregular organic lines and circles and all kinds of uh, forms here and the shapes and all together in a huge space filled with the steel material and you can see here the people right 
uh, you can only walk around this huge uh, sculpture. Uh, it's very, very uh, powerful, actually. And the most interesting thing is that this is the building. How come he managed uh, to put all this material in it? I do not know. Maybe he designed and made it inside. Who knows? Uh, but it's a mystery for me. And you can see there, uh, when you look at the work, uh, you can see uh, the the talent, uh, the skill, uh, the success of uh, of the sculptor actually, right? Uh, the other uh, element, uh, the key elements of design, as you know, is color. Now, color uh, is uh, well described by Hue. So this is the name of the color. Normally, we said color yellow, green. Uh, blue, red, etc. So this is what we call hue. But uh, then there is a saturation, which is about the brightness uh, and the chroma of uh, the hue. Uh, as you see in the middle, from red uh, to gray, there is a transition. There is a kind of a saturation of the same color. And there is also the value according to the light and darkness. Uh, so these are the, the three basic uh, elements of color that we, we use. But there are also tints, tones, and, and shades. Let's look at them. This is a good image to understand the variety of color. So let's, uh, for instance, see the hue is the pure color, yellow. And when this yellow is mixed with white, uh, we call it tints, so it gets lighter, as you see in the second, as you see here, for instance, right? And then when it's uh, it's mixed with gray, and uh, the tones appear here, uh, if you are talking about the yellow one, and then when it uh, meets with um, black, mixed with black, and then it becomes the shade. So this is... And, um, uh, these are important elements of uh, color. So when we are using a color, we will try to use a, in uh, in harmony together with uh, the others using tints and tones and shades and the creative kind of a balance. Uh, we will come to these terms later, right? Yeah. Right, nature. Nature, uh, nature has its own color. So you see uh, the how... Uh, various it is and as soon as you see things like that please uh, use your camera and take some picture because you may use this color later in your design nature and environment are our source of inspiration right people animals uh, and um, history many other things are our source of inspirations but nature is there environment is there every day we experience and when you come across a very interesting light situation like that, or or uh, anything else that interested in you, please take its picture because you are a designer. You're going to be a designer, architect, interior designer, doesn't matter. So you need some source of inspiration. Here, there's a beautiful coordination of colors that you can use in your design. You take certain parts, bring them together, and then uh, create uh, the create a great uh, the harmony. As you see here. Okay, so but but the color exists in as you know everywhere. Uh, there are very colorful uh, cities. Uh, Porto is uh, one of them, or well, in, in Portugal, or uh, another one in, uh, from uh, Mexico, uh, Guanajuato. Uh, it's a beautiful uh, small town, but full of colors. Look at this. This is not my slide, by the way, uh, but it's a beautiful view. Uh, and you see the power of color in such a hot climate. And it's uh, very shocking and enjoyable uh, in one sense. And also it gives identity to certain buildings. Uh, we, we are not going uh, to the details of what identity is, but obviously color is an important element of, uh, of an identity, of a design identity. Okay, so the color exists uh, everywhere, uh, but it's a matter of seeing it and using it. Here we see the uh, light, but we also see the shade and shadow, and also the uh, combination of different uh, colors. Uh, 
or you can use uh, color in your design. This is a totally different uh, experience. Uh, the previous slides, the, this ones, for instance, or this ones, uh, the natural taken from a natural environment, but this is not. This is a designed environment, and designers are using color here purposefully for certain aims uh, and using it in a very, very bold way and in such a beautiful color combination that I was shocked and took this uh, picture. So don't estimate the power of color, okay? You can use it in your design or in your exhibition. This was uh, an exhibition in London in 2016. All right, then another key elements, light. Now, uh, light is crucial for seeing. Okay, it, it enables us to perceive shapes, forms, texture, spaces, color, and so on. If there is no light, well, there is no life, probably. <laughs> uh, natural and artificial lights play different roles in our life, and they create shade and shadow, introducing depth to the perception. So this is a very good picture in that sense. Uh, you can see the light, you can see the perspective, you can see the depth, you can see the contrast, black and whiteness, and the pattern, and many other things, right? Uh, so this is created by the architecture, but also the light, okay? Now, there are natural lights, of course, we use them, but they also change, and it gives a different meaning uh, to the environment. By uh, changing the light, you can see different elements, uh, contrasts, uh, sometimes uh, variety, uh, and also uh, the power of uh, the environment uh, we are in. Now, uh, then from this natural light, let's go to uh, an artificial one. In other words, the light is natural, but the shade and shadow created artificially how come well this is uh, probably uh, realized a sculpture this is uh, a monument uh, it's called monument of road to independence kurtuluş yolu anıtı right it's in selçuk uh, in izmir and the sculptor is a famous turkish sculptor mehmet uh, aksoy now uh, there are very uh, intriguing things with this uh, monument because as it says it's a road so you go through this tunnel and and then go out of it so this is an experience uh, so you live with this experience in that sense i love this uh, sculptor because it's not something that you look at it it's something that you experience through your journey uh, you start walking on this uneven platform. It's uneven because it's very difficult to walk on it. Why is it so? Because uh, the, the, the road uh, to independence was not an easy road. So it reminds us the difficulties faced during those independence uh, days. Okay. And another interesting part of this uh, monument is the shadow. When you look at it, you see a man. This is actually Mustafa Kemal Atatürk, the founder of Turkish Republic. So on 30th of August each year, because it's a very sunny day, you can see the shadow here, right? It's so only one day a year it appears. This is another mysterious part of the, this famous uh, sculpture. And you see how difficult it is to go in. Uh, you have to be careful. Uh, and then once you are in, you go through uh, uh, you, the different stories, reliefs, uh, negatives and positives, and you experience that. So this is uh, Mehmet Aksoy himself, um, and this is the other end of the monument. Right. So you see the, how what shadow, shade, and lights are doing together. It's a creating a totally different atmosphere. If you if you know how to play with them, I'm sure you can create wonderful uh, design works. Right. Now let's change the subject totally. Let's take this understanding of light into an architectural environment. Right. Natural light. Natural light is important for us. Uh, 
therefore, we have to use it uh, as much as possible. So, uh, what is the space? Natural light and space. Yes, we will see some artificial lighting here, but we also see some natural light. So, where are we? Well, we are in a very famous house. This is uh, Alvar Alto House in Helsinki, built in 1936. Okay, almost 90, 95 years ago, right? Okay, uh, it's uh, one of the uh, most important uh, the buildings in those years, uh, still so because of its uh, modernist approach. I'm not going to talk about the styles uh, in this presentation. I assume you are not very familiar with those as a first year student, but this is a very important uh, the house. Now you'll understand why it is. So this is outside, uh, you see the building and inside and the living room. This is Alvar Alto. Uh, and through this living room, uh, you see the door here, you go backyard towards the back room and the studio is there. So it's a house and the studio at the same time. Uh, but what's interesting here is this uh, studio area and this corner window, which is very, very uh, progressive in those years. Today, we, well, we come across that sort of lighting because of the new glass technology and the new modern buildings we have. But uh, 90 years ago, a corner window like this was uh, a rather uh, rare entity. And this is his, um, his study area. Look at how he placed the radiators and the windows, lights. And in winter in Helsinki, when it snows, it must be a beautiful view and daylight here that uh, he enjoyed. Right. So you see how daylights are used in, in, in terrace. But this is not the first one in that sense. There is another one, this one that I have been, these are not my slides, but I have been there and I uh, probably sometimes later I can show my slides about this famous building. This is uh, for me probably uh, one of the best uh, designs in those years. Uh, now, which years I'm talking about? 1924. This is Schroeder House. Uh, very uh, well like built according to uh, the, the Stil uh, style because of the colors and the geometry and the forms. Uh, but it was so progressive. It is still so, actually. You look at the buildings next to that. Look at this building, for instance. <laughs> well, this was taken maybe a few years ago. Uh, it, the building was renovated. It's still there. And imagine 100 years ago almost. Uh, get it, uh, Ritwell is coming and building this. Uh, incredibly, uh, you know, uh, creative, uh, progressive, advanced design. Uh, it's uh, well detailed uh, and and has lots of interesting features. Uh, but uh, the most important one is the one I've just shown to you, is this corner windows that was able, you were able to open it from, you know, towards the outside, like like um, Alvar Alto's uh, corner window. I'm not sure whether Alto knew this. Yeah, probably he, he, he knew. Well, anyway, I cannot speculate on that, right? Okay, so this is uh, the use of corner windows and daylight in, in domestic environment. Now, uh, the fourth uh, key elements of design, texture. Now, materials, uh, as well as natural and human-made objects, have visual and tactile qualities which can be part of a design. Right? So you can use this element. For instance, the brick is being used there. Uh, the most important, probably the building in that sense, is uh, Indian Institute of Management in Ahmedabad, uh, designed by Louis Kahn, a famous building. You see the texture and, and the light, and also you see uh, the shade and everything here. Right? It's a beautiful uh, the building. Now, uh, texture, uh, you may come across it everywhere. So I have seen this in, in, in Ephesus when I was visiting the houses built on the hills. It's a separate part of uh, the Ephesus antique site. And you'll be uh, 
taken there separately. And you see here, there is a glass platform. You walk on the glass, glass platform and travel around. You never touch on these uh, surfaces. You see them from the uh, distance. A beautiful uh, small museum within Ephesus, I would say, and able to see this, uh, well, uh, 2,000 years old, maybe more, uh, textures and patterns on the floor, like a carpet. Uh, it's still uh, there, surviving with all these beautiful, uh, you know, designs, I would say. Right. So the, the, uh, the texture is everywhere and it's part of designed elements. This was from an exhibition in Istanbul. Uh, and you can see how uh, different uh, shapes are used uh, in order to create a texture and the pleasure of texture. It may look incomplete, but uh, this may be the part of the pleasure. Uh, this is something else. So maybe I should uh, talk in a different lecture, but not today. The beauty is not always uh, perfect uh, in perfectness of any kind of objects or things. Sometimes imperfect things could be, could be uh, very, very beautiful. Now, I'll give you an example later. Okay, there is one. Right. And what's this? Yes, this is a texture. This is a texture. This is a texture created by the nature, right? The hail. I was in my office and all of a sudden there was rain and then hail. Look at that. Look at the natural texture created uh, by, the, uh, by the environment. Right? So the, you can see them everywhere and take it and use it in a different way. Uh, it's up to you to be able to find your own sources of design. As I said before, nature is one of them. Oh, here it is. Uh, this is not designed. This is naturally developed texture, a wall with lots of uh, plants and flowers and color, but it has its own visual quality. Uh, well, uh, it's like a painting, isn't it? Just to frame it and use it. <laughs> Yes, key elements of design, another one, shape and form, shape and form. Now, we, we looked at lines, we looked at color, we looked at other features, but when they come together, the lines, they create shape and form. Shape is two, form is three-dimensional. When we are talking about shape, we are talking about squares, circles, triangles, these are regular or geometric shapes. There are irregular shapes as well uh, that we cannot easily name them but uh, we can create them. Uh, and there are also, uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, forms. Forms composed of uh, uh, geometric shapes, like cubes, spheres, cylinders, cones, triangles, right? These are geometric forms. There are uh, non-geometric forms as well, of course, organic forms in, in, in life. So when do they, uh, how do they reflect on design and architecture? Uh, well, the best example regarding the geometric uh, shapes and forms, I think this very famous chair by uh, Gerrit Ritwell, again, the one who designed the Schroeder house. Actually, he was a furniture builder. And this Schroeder house is like a furniture, although it's a house, but it's like a furniture, right? Uh, and I didn't feel it unless I visited the place because every part was moving uh, and every detail was perfectly designed and built and still working. Now, this is his famous red and blue chair. You can see the power of geometry. It's comfortable though, it's a bit small, uh, but when you sit on it, maybe it's a bit difficult to stand up because of the angles, but it's a very famous uh, chair that it has been used uh, in his Schroeder house that I just mentioned, right? You can see it's there. Okay. Uh, now the shapes, uh, of course, the most uh, important one, probably everybody knows, is pyramids. But I'm not going to show you the pyramids from Egypt this time. I will take you to the other part of the world, to Mexico, Teotihuacan. Uh, this is uh, the Pyramid of Sun, right? And then you see the people up there and you can understand the scale and how big it is actually but there are other uh, pyramids uh, in, in that yucatan area of mexico 
goes back to uh, Mayan uh, culture. And it's one of them is this, um, it's called El Castillo. It means the castle because uh, uh, Spaniards, Spanish uh, conquistadors or, or invaders, when they came here, uh, they thought this is a castle and they called it El Castillo. Actually, it's, uh, it's a pyramid, uh, a temple, right? But this is a stepped pyramid, different uh, than the other one, right? Uh, so you see more powerfully uh, how the shapes and forms are and stairs are used to create a monument, uh, right? But uh, there are other, uh, well, very contemporary one. Uh, this is a famous uh, by a famous artist, Cristo. Uh, it was opened in Hyde Park in uh, 2018, made out of barrels. Uh, you know, it's a floating kind of huge structure in the middle of Hyde Park. I don't know how many hundreds uh, or maybe thousands used, but it was there when I visited. Uh, so it's, in other words, these forms are still valid. Uh, they are not ancient traditional forms, but we can always use them. Or as we see here, for instance, uh, in, in, in Lourdes, uh, this is uh, a, a famous uh, pyramid by uh, I.M. Pei, a very famous American architect. He was asked to design an extension uh, for the Lure Museum, but you see the character of the museum, kind of, uh, you know, uh, Baroque, Rococo, eclectic architecture, very powerful historical, historical building. What can you do? Uh, well, he created uh, a crystal clear glass pyramid, uh, not higher than that one, it's a kind of a respect, and took everything underneath. Uh, so this is just an entrance of it. Uh, very cleverly done, and you see the relationship between uh, a geometric, strong geometric form, glass, and then opposite to that, uh, the stone and baroque and totally different uh, architectural uh, understanding. Right. So, or uh, well, it's a sad story uh, because it refers to a Holocaust uh, in Germany. Uh, designed by Peter Eisenman, American uh, architect, and just using a geometric forms representing people with their size and shapes, they create a, an urban landscape, which is which is uh, very very I think strong uh, and effective and powerful. Uh, right, shape and form, uh, shape and form. Uh, and lines are everywhere in our life. So when we design, as you see, this is a design of mine. Uh, we, we use this uh, shapes and forms, rectangles, circles, lights, and everything, everything in it. So this is how they come together to express uh, design ideas. Now, uh, let's come to this point, uh, the key elements of design, material and tacit knowledge, the one I edit, because you may not find this in the list. For me, the material is an important one, right? Uh, because without material, uh, well, we can only uh, design virtual environments. Today, it's possible. Today, we design non-material things as well, uh, uh, thanks to artificial intelligence, so augmented reality, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But material is uh, still an essential element of design. And while you are dealing with this material, you use a tacit knowledge. So uh, what is tacit knowledge? A kind of knowledge that you cannot easily transfer from one person to another by writing or showing, but, but by experiencing they can they can get this tacit knowledge. So this uh, craft mostly actually uh, based on this tacit knowledge. Blowing a glass is a big experience, right? It's not something that you can easily do. Uh, you have to go through this experience and how to control it because it's very, very hot, as you know. You have to be very careful. Another one, uh, this time it's not that hot, <laughs> but it's muddy, okay, uh, pottery. Here again, uh, these people are giving shape to this material with the experience and the knowledge and the skill 
that they have. Right? Uh, so this is, uh, again, you, they produce uh, design uh, thanks to the material, thanks to the knowledge they have. Okay. And, oh yes, uh, that's the one I was uh, talking about. Uh, Kintsugi is the Japanese art of putting putting broken pottery pieces back together with gold. What does it mean? You have a you have a pottery, okay? It's broken. What will you do? Well, normally we throw it away. Japanese don't do. Well, it depends on the uh, quality of the uh, the pottery we are talking about. They bring these pieces together and repair them, but they repair it with gold, right? And all of a sudden this object turns into something else, very, very valuable, maybe aesthetically as well. It's, it's not symmetrical, as you see. It has a, this asymmetric quality that it has. But it, since it was composed of different materials uh, with shining lights and everything, uh, you know, it's, it has its own secret beauty and, the, uh, and also the value thanks to gold, right? Uh, so they know how to use um, uh, materials, even if it's uh, not in perfect shape, how to value it, how to develop it. So don't throw anything you uh, think useless. You may do different things with those that. Uh, well, at one point, I, I also was interested in it. And uh, how can I uh, repair an object or use an object in a different uh, way than it was uh, designed to be. Uh, so uh, here it is. This is an example. You can take an object, change its function, and use it. Well, fine. Uh, so don't throw it away. OK. Uh, so another um, tacit knowledge and the material I think is this hair design. I, I love this ancient hair designs. I don't think they used to have, or Roman times, to draw those things. Where probably they developed the skill first, the uh, skill of giving shape to hair. Uh, and then later, uh, centuries later, it was drawn. Uh, but uh, you cannot do it by drawing. You have to experience it. You have to learn it from a master. Uh, and then through tacit knowledge that you get, and then you can make it, I guess. But you see how beautiful they are, right? So uh, doesn't, uh, it doesn't mean that this kind of tacit knowledge exists in the past. But today, we also have a new kind of tacit knowledge when we are using our advanced computer programs. So these are a different kind of shapes and forms created by uh, uh, CNC and other technologies. Look at the variety of chairs experienced, right? Uh, so this technology is uh, available today. So we can uh, be master of it and try to create alternatives which will be more suitable uh, to the purpose. So we can experience as much as we want. These are a small scale experience, <coughs> I would say, experiments. Sorry. Now, well, we came to uh, a key element of space. Space is the area where things are born, exist, survive, move and die. Its coexistence with time generates and constitutes various relationships, such as between man and his environment. Space is the subject of design as well as its object. So in that sense, uh, space is a very complicated issue. I'm not going to into the details, just to make you aware of the variety of it. I will show some examples. Uh, here, for instance, you see two contradictory environments. One is from uh, America, New Mexico. It's an open space, open space. And the other one is uh, entirely different, an enclosed uh, space. Uh, from Roman times uh, in Rome, actually, in Pantheon, Rome. Uh, you see the scale, how big it is. These are the heads of the people. And you see an iPhone here. <laughs> Very funny. Uh, someone is taking the picture of uh, the opening here. Okay. But, uh, but there are other spaces as well. Let's go to Mexico again. This is an open space. 
but in such a way that people are using it differently. Uh, Teotihuacan uh, in Mexico, uh, the buildings are scared around temples and a huge long uh, alley, right? Or a totally defined space, one of the best squares in the world, Siena Square in Italy, and it's surrounded by buildings, well-defined uh, space. But there are also domestic spaces here, uh, designed by Charles René McIntosh and Margaret MacDonald, designed in 1901. This is an Art Nouveau space, actually, if you ask me to name it. But this is a domestic space, a very controlled one with lights, the artificial lights you can see, daylights, and uh, the elements of interiors, they all speak with the same language. Okay, so uh, in that sense, uh, space uh, is probably a uh, very, very important element of design because we design for space uh, as architects or we create spaces. That's another issue. <laughs> okay, uh, now let's look at the principles of design. Uh, right, what are they? Uh, let's, let me give a definition first. Principles of design are abstract concepts which tell us how to use the elements of design. For example, if elements of design are words, Principles of design are the grammar informing us how to bring these words together to make a sentence and a statement. So it's designer's task to make this statement useful, meaningful, poetic, beautiful, and so on. Okay, so we gave uh, you some key elements of design that you are making, and now we give you some principles that you will be using to realize it. What are these principles? Proportion, scale, harmony, balance, unity, variety, contrast, rhythm, and emphasis. Okay, let's uh, look at them with uh, some examples. So, proportion. What's proportion? Proportion is the relationship of parts of a design in such a way that the, uh, e to each other and to the whole, such as between large and small sizes of windows within a house. The relationship, the relationship of parts of a design to each other and to the whole. Now, that's important, proportion, uh, parts and the whole. So where does it come from? Well, this is uh, the famous golden ratio. It was used in ancient time. It's probably still being used. It's called sometimes as golden mean, sometimes as golden uh, section. It's uh, the proportion of a rectangle, right? Uh, this one and this one. If you divide it into this, the figure you get is 1618. But there is a secret in it. Okay. So if C, G, F, E is a rectangle according to a golden ratio, you can divide it into two and get D, K, F, E. It's also a golden ratio. Or you can have J, H, K, F, that I have shown all these things here. This is another one with golden ratio. Or this one is another one. This one is another. So it's an endless process. It goes and on and on. And spiral is a good representation of that one. This is being used in, in architecture. It's an easy way of obtaining it graphically is this. You draw a square and you go uh, use you uh, the same distance here and then oops sorry uh, and right and you get point c that's how it is made uh, geometrically actually now well where it's been used here for instance uh, in acropolis uh, is the famous uh, uh, temple look uh, how it's this uh, red one uh, shows uh, the analysis of that, how it's being uh, created. Uh, right. Parthenon. Right. Another one in uh, in uh, Renaissance time, famous architect, Don Battista Alberti, and how he employed geometry for his design. You can make this analysis in many uh, historical uh, buildings and elements or even uh, a Georgian style house uh, from the United Kingdom, right? Look at this. 
it has also following uh, the same rules of uh, the golden ratio. Okay. Uh, now, but uh, but I like this one, uh, Inigo Jones' uh, Banqueting House, Whitehall, uh, London. Uh, it's one of the early modernist, in one sense, modernist building of the of the UK. I would say a very famous architect. Uh, he brought light uh, and also new concepts. He his proportion is two cubes. He, argue, he was arguing that probably. A uh, space like this made out of two cubes and the interior is like that. You can see how light it is, how, uh, you know, uh, well, uh, structure wise as well. Very clear. Uh, it's a big uh, banqueting hall, very simple architecture. Uh, and also using huge uh, windows like this, a very uh, novel, very a progressive thing for those years. But the interesting part is the ceiling, because the ceilings are decorated by the famous uh, uh, artist Rubens. It's full of uh, his works. And if, when you visit this building, uh, you will see there are uh, leather cushions. You go there and lay down and look at the ceiling. Or, as I did here, there is a mirror you can see uh, by looking at the mirror, you can see the ceiling. It's this very interesting <clears throat> building to visit if you go to London. Now, another principle uh, is the scale. A contextual relationship comparing dimensional objects such as the proportional size of a door to all other doors or to human beings and to the space in which it belongs, right? Here, the main criteria is obviously the human being, because we design space for people. So we have to pay attention to their size uh, and design it accordingly. If it's too low, it's too low. Well, if the, you imagine the ceiling is not very high or very, very high, then you will be lost in it. Uh, so that distance uh, or the scale between, the, uh, between us uh, and an artificial physical environment around us. That relationship is a very important one. Of course, the famous architects were aware of it. Look, this is Leonardo da Vinci's We Tribune Man, and this is uh, the famous uh, German uh, uh, architect Ernst Neufert, uh, actually, uh, developed that, and Le Corbusier's The Modular, 1953. So uh, these famous architects were designing according to human scale. But this, when you look at those ones, except uh, Le Corbusier's, these are ideal uh, men, uh, men. That's important. Why not women? <laughs> we have to ask these gender questions. But there are people asking that questions. Uh, for instance, I found this, Eduardo Sosa. Uh, he was very critical, I think, uh, with uh, the concept of general human body. Yes, we are not ideal anymore, or be, never been ideal probably as human beings. We are tall, short, fat, slim, whatever. So we, we have to design for people, for all shapes. Uh, that old concept of ideal man and Renaissance man may not be valid anymore. And, and thanks to new nutrition systems, uh, our uh, bodies are changing from generation to generation. That's another issue. Right. Okay, another principle of design is harmony. Harmony is the effect created by high level of similarities amongst parts constituting the whole together with the elimination of controversy and contradictions. So this uh, similarity uh, is an important element amongst the parts and there shouldn't be any tension between them. But here it is, to give you an example, uh, a tree of uh, life. Uh, well, again, uh, an image from uh, Mexico, you can see uh, how many different objects exist, uh, but they are not contradicting or they are not rival of each other, and they create a harmony when they come together. It doesn't disturb you. When you look at it, you can see the overall shape of it, but when you go into the details, you can see different stories in each different part, but uh, they are well 
distributed and you don't see any tension between different elements of it you see the harmony now here as well we see the harmony <coughs> because they are all chairs right that's an uh, the elements uh, but they are all different chairs elements are different but their they are their characteristics are the same they are chairs we have something we sit on it not necessarily chairs but we sit on it and they have similar kind of size uh, and placed orderly at the end it creates an harmony or this one that you can see this harmony look at uh, the pots uh, all same color except these two in the middle but they were <coughs> placed in the same orderly way uh, and it follows uh, the line of the steps and it's also there are another orderly things placed and the colors are the similar kind of tones of the uh, the same uh, color or similar ones so it doesn't disturb us there is a good uh, the harmony here balance is another principle that we used here two different uh, hands but they create a balance and they very simple no need to explain actually now yes there are symmetrical balances as you see here probably you did similar things in your design work i'm not sure but uh, these are artworks uh, by the way uh, and, and and an architectural one let's go to a famous building again this time villa rotonda uh, 1571 by andrea palladio uh, you see the balance the symmetry uh, and the central aspect of it and how powerful building it is yes in italy villa rotonda is go back to 16th century 1571 by andre palladio okay this is the image from uh, from uh, above right you, this, the symmetry the power the central element and everything is so uh, clear visible uh, so plain and and very very powerful or asymmetrical balance yes there's another thing and i found this balance here in, in a sculpture that i've seen in uh, taiwan uh, men and women uh, and how although asymmetrical but you see the equality and the balance uh, you know uh, so i like that or another this time a furniture a sofa designed by a famous architect zaha hadith uh, okay or a central balance this is a plant but you see uh, how center is attracting all the others <laughs> or the other way around <laughs> everything is coming out of uh, the center but when you look at uh, the nature you can find lots of elements like that the unity uh, unity is the collection of elements seen as visually related whole here well the scene is uh, something that we are very familiar during this epidemic uh, period in Italy, uh, mostly it started, people were uh, making music, singing in their flats uh, and trying to entertaining their uh, neighbors, they're creating a good uh, unity. So the unity is being achieved by, uh, you know, uh, the subject, they all are playing and uh, singing and joining, but also the windows and the shapes and the colors are part of this wholeness. Right. Unity and variety. Uh, to understand the, what it is, clearly, I put this image. So on the left-hand side, you see unity is achieved by the same color. They're all same. And the right hand side you see unity is achieved by the size they're all same size and then variety is different colors here is the variety is different shape and we can come across this in life here this one i've seen in london london fair in 2016 uh look they are all unity you can see the same uh, circular forms all different colors and there's also variety and then uh, a kind of harmony when they come together. So these are very close expressions. The unity here is very clear, I think. When you look at uh, the ceiling, lighting, you, forms and the colors are all all same. Also on the wall, uh, the pattern used here is part of that uh, unity, I guess. Okay, 
And then let's go to see some examples from the variety. Variety is the tension between opposing elements, such as between straight and curved lines. As soon as I came across this, I remember this slide of mine taken in, in London, in one of the parks. Uh, you see the uh, tension between different uh, elements of the structure. Uh, geometric forms uh, and curves, etc. And this creates another dimension uh, in reality because there are shades and shadows and depths uh, and uh, the, in one sense the, the harmony over there. Or the variety is here very obvious. But there are some similarities too, the round uh, you know, the wheels and the round shapes and rounds here, and then different, uh, you know, colors separate, placed in a very balanced way. And uh, despite uh, this variety, it has a kind of uh, common units, bringing them together and to create a harmony, I think. Or in this one, it's maybe more powerfully uh, placed, yes. They are all chairs, but all different, all looking in different size um, or similar, but not entirely different than each other, placed in a, in a very, uh, you know, meaningful way. And it creates a kind of relationship with the painting behind and the colors, etc. So uh, you can see the variety, but also a kind of composition that it exists there and uh, it's a meaningfully placed uh, uh, furniture. Now, the uh, seven principles of design. Contrast. Contrast means the arrangement of opposite elements and their effects. Therefore, contrast requires radical differences between two or more elements in a composition or design. Here, there are birds, uh, same size. OK, this is not uh, you know, a contrast. They're all same size-wise, okay? This could have been bigger, the other one could be smaller, for instance, but these are black and this is white. And these are looking at the left, this is looking at right. So th this is uh, the contrast that we, we can see. But uh, I like the contrast in the slides of mine uh, in northern part of Portugal, I think I uh, shot this. I like the way trees are uh, leaning towards the other direction because of the north uh, wings. But the contrast is here with this element, because this is man-made. The trees are uh, made by nature. And this is uh, still, this is wood. Uh, and this is straight. These are not. So you can see the variety of the contrast that they, this man-made and the natural elements created. So this is, again, a contrast in nature. Or this one. This one, uh, well, what, what the hell is happening here? We look at it carefully. You see the brick blocks, not in good shape, and trying to holding a beautiful building. Uh, no, this is an artwork, of course. This is uh, a museum, a Maxim Museum designed by Zaha Hadid, and the artwork is around that and, and create a contrast with this great, beautiful uh, concrete building and this brick. Uh, concrete and brick, right? Uh, white and red, okay, contrast, and uh, imperfect uh, forms and the perfect forms, right? So, uh, and irregular uh, or organic forms of the museum and this concrete forms. Here it is, another, another view of the museum. Okay, uh, well, uh, what do we see here? Hmm. We see something else. Uh, in addition to this contrast, we see another kind of contrast, which is here. Look at that. The, this building itself is very modern, no doubt about that. Uh, typical Zaha style. And there are glasses here. And in this, on this glass, you see the reflection of the environment. This building is surrounded by buildings like that. And this glass is reflecting it reflecting the environment and creating a contrast with itself and how beautifully made how beautifully designed incredible that's the building and that's the old ones and you see the reflection there 
And the building is responding to its environment, how nice it is, in a different way, in a different way. It's, it's not rejecting uh, uh, the uh, existing cityscape, but it takes it into it and use it. Right, it's beautiful. Right, another, another uh, contrast, but this time contrast with the color black and red, black and red, black and red. Yes, this is another museum in Rome, uh, Macro Museum by Odile Deck, a French uh, woman architect, uh, and she loves red and black. Uh, she wears black always and red lip lipsticks. Uh, a nice person, <laughs> by the way. So but here, the contrast is this time, in this slide, of course, uh, the ceiling and this red platform. In the previous one, with black and the red, but in this one, this glass uh, and the composite, uh, you know, elements made out of steel cables and and this plainness of the surface and different colors here, uh, red here. So this is uh, this creates a contrast as well. The rhythm, rhythm is a concept of systematic repetition, alteration, or progression of design and or its elements, which provide dynamic shapes and forms. Here it is. Uh, this is John Curtin School of Medical Research. You see how elements of uh, building creates uh, a progression, a movement, actually. Uh, another example, a very famous one, I'm sure you all know about that or heard about it. John Utson Sydney Opera House, built in 1973. Uh, no need to say a word. Or this is a new one, uh, Kengo Kuma, the Dundee architecture. Here we don't only see the repetition, rhythm, uh, but also we see lots of lines and reflections. Uh, this is a picture of mine uh, using, of course, the image of shadow and making a kind of uh, uh, reflection of the building uh, and a kind of allegory with the tent, uh, with the fence, sorry, with the fence and the building itself. But uh, here it is, the rhythm of the building that you you feel it uh, when you go underneath as well. Okay, the emphasis, uh, nine emphasis, it's to indicate the most important element of a given design configuration. Normally items in the center are considered to be significant, so the center is the considered to be, but not always center. Here, this is a picture of mine, a photograph of mine. Here is uh, not the center, but the emphasis here at that point. The building itself is indicating that one, but naturally, as soon as I've seen some people are walking, I took this photograph and concentrating on this, on this uh, uh, junction when the shadows and the architecture are meeting and the head of the person is there, right? Uh, yes, this one I like very much. When I've seen it, I've seen like a flying saucers in the air. It's how beautiful it is. It's a tent. It's a sculpture by Janet Eckelman. Uh, and it's like, a, as I said, something is flying in the air. And I found a film, how did they make it? I hope it works. Yes, this could have been a wonderful uh, 
end, but uh, I decided to, to slightly extend my presentation and make it to short uh, analysis uh, for you, how I use these uh, elements, how I use these principles when I'm looking around. So uh, that's why I use this image uh, that I've shown you uh, in the very beginning. Uh, it belongs to a house designed by a French sculptor, Jean-Claude Jacquemart. Uh, he lives with his wife, Ülkü, in, in Kash, Turkey. And he himself designed this entire house that you see on the left-hand side. Right? Inside, outside, everything he designed himself. He's a sculptor. Now, then I took this uh, picture uh, of uh, the stairs, which is in the center of the house. And I started to apply our, uh, to look at it with the design uh, elements to, from the point of, in terms of design elements, I look at it. But line, for instance, immediately, you know, spotted the zigzag lines, flat lines or curved lines or color, which uh, obviously it's there, no need to say, or lights, uh, or the shade, uh, you can see the reflection of the handrail, uh, or the reflection of the beams and the daylights and shadow. And the texture is there on the carpet or uh, the texture of the materials itself. And the shapes and forms are uh, everywhere, of course, inevitably. And there was a, a kind of a tacit knowledge. How come someone create a one single piece of uh, wood handrail like this? This is a material and tacit knowledge that he made. It's possible, of course, with this uh, today's technology, but he built this, he made it uh, on his own in his little uh, furniture workshop next to the next to the building. Okay, and then the space, uh, this is in the middle. So in front of the stairs, there is a living room and behind the stairs, there is a kitchen. So it's a kind of a separation of that one. Then we'll look at the principles. Uh, the proportion is there, okay, up and down, and you can see it clearly. Uh, the scale, uh, how it's changing, uh, the scale of the handrail, or the harmony created uh, there uh, with uh, different kind of levels of objects, and also natural harmony. I like this cats lining up. Well, yeah, it's an incident, of course, but <laughs> it may happen. Or the balance symmetrical and asymmetrical here. Uh, the unity, it's there uh, in its entirety. Variety of the uh, shapes, uh, rectangles and boxes, uh, or the contrast to elements, uh, to handrails uh, are really creating a contrast there. And the rhythm of the steps uh, and different size of storage units built under the stairs are creating that rhythm. And also there is an emphasis, of course, it's in the center. I think it's the time to uh, finish my presentation and thank you for your attendance. Right. Yes. Hello. Are you there? Yeah, hello, Ojan. Uh, thank you very much. I mean, it is really inspiring, and I think it is really uh, revealing for us because we spend a, a three month semester uh, trying to question what design is, what architecture is, or what uh, ourselves are doing in uh, environment. So we were questioning these things, and it was kind of a reveal to us. Uh, I would like to uh, ask our students to uh, ask some questions to you and uh, I mean, maybe try to build up uh, an interaction. Will be excellent. Will be excellent. Okay, uh, who wants to? Okay, everybody is shy at the moment. <laughs> It's it's normal. <laughs> we were shy as well when we were students, <laughs> but that, that's why the first thing I uh, I teach to my students is how to ask a question. If they don't know how to ask a question, they will never find an answer. They may not know the answer, but unless they know the question, 
that's excellent. That's the beginning of it. Yes. Yes. Uh... I don't know. I mean, I have a lot of questions, but I think uh, after one question, they will be uh, okay to generate questions. I know. The, the first question is always the most difficult one. And then hundreds of uh, questions come to learn. <laughs> uh, okay, okay. Well, I may ask them a question. Which, which yes. slide is the most interesting slide for you and why? Which one did you like? Because some of them are artistically taken, some of them are technical uh, images. Okay, so my name is Emmanuel. Thank you so much for this privilege. Okay, the, the slide that really inspires me is the slide that talks about the lines and how you also indicate how we can uh, indicate lines in every building that we see, how lines, like we can use lines to form something, either objects, uh, anything that uh, you you inspire us to know that line can form anything, so we should not underestimate line. And I think I love that slide. Thank you, thank you so much. Uh, well, line is the beginning of everything, isn't it? <laughs> uh, all letters, uh, alphabets, and everything compose of lines. If you go back to the history as well, therefore, it's a very powerful uh, instrument that we have today, and we are still using it. Actually, uh, in um, UK uh, drawing is the most essential element of it. You can't live in that. You think that well, everything is computerized and we can use this technology to express ourselves. No, they really go back to uh, you know nature with their uh, papers and pens and draw it, draw again and again and again, life drawings and everything. Because drawing is observing and thinking at the same time. It's a kind of a philosophical thing as well, not only an exercise or experiment. It's more than that. In that sense, I'm very glad that you got the, the, the spirit and the power of lines. Thank you. And uh, I mean, maybe not related that much, but uh, this morning we were uh, questioning uh, the notes of, uh, I mean, of a symphony of from Beethoven. Uh, and of course there are some lines, but it forms the uh, structure of the uh, grammar, let's say. And then, I mean, they were building up some uh, dots or some measurements. So it was really interesting also to see how to form the language or the vocabulary. Uh, we have, uh, sorry. No, no, please, if there is a question, yes, of course, I'd like to take it. Bingara, you were raising your hand. Hello, my name is Dingara. Now, I actually wanted to respond when you were saying one of our favorite slides, and I love all the slides that you showed about um, Zara, Haz ha Zara Hadid, Hadid. Because, mm -hmm. yes, because she she's actually the architect who inspired me to be an architect and to imagine more. So my question, I think I have a question on symmetry and geometry. What do you think inspired people to notice symmetry and geometry over time what say again what people uh, sorry um, what yeah. inspired what inspired people to notice symmetry and geometry uh well it goes back to ancient times uh because uh, symmetry is a very uh, powerful uh, wheel uh, a vehicle uh, to design and it always uh, has its own, uh, you know, strong uh, presence everywhere. And in ancient times, in order to build, uh, you need knowledge of uh, mathematics, you need knowledge of uh, geometry. In fact, the ancient uh, Greeks or Roman, later Roman times or earlier Egyptian times, you know, the architecture there requires obviously knowledge of mathematics and geometry. Right? And then, uh, obviously, uh, the most powerful uh, images created by them were based on uh, symmetry. Uh, and later, uh, they were also in those years uh, looking for an ideal 
beauty. If you go look at the ancient uh, literature, uh, you can see how uh, Spartans and Athenians in ancient Greece were studying, exercising, and developing a wonderful body because they were uh, trying to find an ideal human uh, human appearance, uh, human presence, uh, and beautiful, beautiful bodies. Therefore, uh, it was symmetrical as well, of course, uh, in that sense. So the symmetry uh, was, uh, since the very beginning, a very uh, strong, uh, you know, uh, the element of design. But then, obviously, things change, uh, and now we have uh, organic forms, uh, asymmetrical forms, etc. Uh, so, uh, yes, you can look at the history from this point of view. That's a very interesting point. How the symmetry was born and how it was developed and what were the uh, other uh, contrary elements uh, to uh, symmetry and, uh, and the power of asymmetrical design. But because the common composition as well, in artworks as well, they were always considering a kind of a balance not necessarily symmetrical ones, but also a composition composed of, uh, you know, uh, the, the balance. Yes, uh, I wonder whether this is an answer to your question, but it's a good way of looking at things. Uh, we still do have symmetry today uh, in many objects and environments surrounding us, but uh, asymmetry it has its own power too. You cannot underestimate the beauty of organic forms as well. If you look at Antonio Gaudi's work, uh, a Spanish, uh, you know, the architect, uh, then you can see all kinds of, uh, you know, forms and shapes. So the power of design comes from not only its uh, essence as symmetrical or asymmetrical, but also with other elements in it. So symmetry is one of the powerful tools that we use. But uh, today it's probably a bit old fashioned. <laughs> uh, I don't know. If, uh, it's worth thinking about it. Yeah. Uh, oh, one more question. Uh, but uh, I also want to add I mean, beauty was uh, sometimes we were uh, struggling in uh, and perceiving the beauty because we call beautiful, but then we are uh, really having hard times to express what it really is. So it was really interesting to understand the story behind uh, the formation of the beauty, let's say. Or maybe you called in your uh, lecture the depth of the perception. So it was, it is interesting for us. Okay, Dingara is, has another one. Do you think technological advancement can ever be considered an element? Uh, of course, uh, the new technology is uh, really helping us to, uh, to develop uh, new skills. The, the CNC is computer programs. Uh, you can create all kinds of shapes now uh, just with, uh, you know, uh, free flow. Uh, you don't need uh, strong uh, drawing talents anymore. Uh, but the uh, computers are enabling you to create, uh, you know, any kind of shape you want. Uh, and also uh, they calculated whether it is uh, reasonable, feasible to build, etc. Yes, uh, we cannot uh, ignore. On the other hand, we have to be very careful with this new technologies, especially artificial intelligence and uh, augmented reality. Uh, these are, uh, you know, inevitable uh, results of developments, but which direction they will go and where will we be within it uh, are good, good questions. Uh, yes, uh, technology is very, very important. Uh, and also, uh, in one sense, maybe uh, dangerous as well. You never know uh, which direction people will use this technology and for what purposes. Yes. That's the question we always have in mind. Okay, Taif Kojam. Uh, I'm trying to insist on some other questions, but uh, I think they... Anybody else? 
Yeah. Oh. Hello, my name is Precious. Um, um, what um, I'm really interested, like what interests me most is the, you know, the elements of color design and the elements and principles of design. Like what really inspires this idea of architecture and design? Well, uh, sort of inspiration you are asking for. Is this right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, well, uh, uh, hmm. Uh, it depends. It depends on uh, on the architecture. First, you said the color. Now, let's take Odile Deck. Odile Deck is probably the second most famous women uh, designer of the world after Zaha Hadid, I would say. Odile Deck wears only black and use only the red, as you see in her designs. So this is her uh, consistent approach to his architecture, using similar, same kind of colors in a different uh, format. But source of inspiration uh, is a very uh, wide area. You may use nature to get source of inspiration. You may look at the shells, you may look at the animals, their, uh, you know, forms, uh, or you can look at uh, the society, how people are wearing different kind of garments and dresses with, with each color. Or you can look at uh, the structures. You can get your inspiration from history. How was it built in history? Uh, so it depends what your interests are. But, uh, but uh, normally, uh, we, uh, well, even the music. Yes, you were just talking about Bach and the music. And I haven't shown you today, but uh, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, a French philosopher, is one of the one uh, of the yes the, one of the uh, writers who design who define design with harmony and music music is part of it and you are not composing a music but in one sense you are designing a piece of music so this element of design uh, with uh, notes or lines and shapes are part of inspiration as well. And if you look at the history, for instance, Baroque music is uh, elements of Baroque architecture and also Baroque uh, garments. So the similar kind of uh, thing can be seen in different parts of histories as well, or neoclassicism, a classic music and classic architecture uh, kind of thing. So uh, source of inspirations are in everywhere. It depends how you see them and how you benefit them, how you reflect them uh, on your own design and architecture. If your ambition, your, your desire is dealing with colors, yes, you can create wonderful, colorful architecture. And there are examples of it in, in, in history. You can find that. Yes, uh, so it depends what attracts deep perspective. Yes, of course. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yes, yeah, sorry, I, I, I can interrupt you. No, uh, okay. Uh, any other comment? Okay, they are tired. <laughs> yes, they are tired. Teyfi uh, Kocam, thank you very much for uh, this wonderful uh, presentation. Uh, do you have anything to say uh, for the well, end? Uh, well, yes, actually, there are always things to say, uh, but uh, for me, probably the most important uh, question is uh, to be able to ask questions, yes, to be to, uh, critical of everything and, and uh, try to understand the reasons behind why these things are uh, being formed like that. What are the what are the ideas behind it? What is the function of that little piece, whatever it is? Right. Always ask questions and try to find your own answers to that and compare with the answers given to you. That's how you will be able to develop your own design identity. That's the most important thing. What is what makes you different than the others? What is your uh, characteristics of design? Are you, uh, uh, you know, concentrated on 
uh, fluidity? Are you concentrated on the new structures? Are you concentrated on creating new space with color, shade and shadow? Or new experience that people go through uh, of experience of new spaces? Uh, environments using sound, wind, uh, I don't know. What makes you different than the others? That's the questions you need to ask always. If you find the answer, yes, you'll become a designer. That's what it is, I think, I think. But anyway, I enjoy talking. Um, Thank you very much, uh, Taif Kocam. Uh, hope to see you soon again. Uh, then say, Bye bye. Goodbye. Thank you. It was a pleasure talking to you. I hope one day we will come together and share our experience in a lovely environment like that. Ciao. Ciao, everybody. Bye bye. Bye. Do you remember how you discovered the world around you? Can you hear the beat of life? Can you hear it? by seeing it and feeling with all your senses. Hey, can you still hear it? There's something in you, driving you, calling you. Calling you in closer and closer. It's happening right now. Time to free your curiosity that's always in you. Now, it's time to act. This is an act of discovery. It requires looking to the world in new ways. not offering you the answers. We are here to encourage your questions, but more important than the question is how you answer it. Try the ordinary, then try the unusual. To live is learn and to learn is to live live learn it's an endless process this is your path this is your journey you decide how it's going to be just enjoy every moment of it We believe in design, keeping it simple but also significant. We believe in art for looking at the world with a unique perspective. We believe in creativity for communicating better with the world. Creativity takes courage. The future belongs to the curious. Come and experience it with us in Arakad and discover your creative potential.